pastor here at Journey. It's an honor to have you worshiping with us this weekend. If it's your first time, we want to say welcome to you and thank you for choosing to be here with us at Journey Church um, this weekend. We're excited about what God's doing in our church and, and, and things that are happening in our church. Several things, events going, uh, it's coming up in the next few weeks from honoring our graduates from high school and college, Mother's Day, we're going to be doing baby dedication. Uh, next week, I believe, is uh, membership lunch. You can sign up in the connections area, but all of those events will be up on the screen in just a moment. You'll see that. It's on our website at embracethejourney.tv, but you can also see all that uh, behind me on the screen as well uh, while we uh, take up the offering. I want to uh, pray over that as we worship through our giving and thank God for what He's doing. This morning we had some technical difficulties. Our soundboard crashed. We had to put a different soundboard in and wire it all this morning, and so it, it put us behind in first service and into the second service as well, and so we thank you for being patient with that, but we believe in that, that God's going to do a great work this morning as we continue in this series that we're in. So let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your grace, for your love. Lord, that you gave your life sacrificially for us because you loved us. Lord, may in our worship we give back to you. Lord, may we give sacrificially. Lord, may you take what we give this morning through our um, worship and our offering. And we give back, God, and use it to advance your kingdom. Use it to do great and mighty things that only you can do as we trust you with the future. 
And we thank you for what's going to happen in this place this morning, that life change will take place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to the book of John chapter 19. We're going to cover a lot of ground this morning uh, as we continue in this series called uh, Reset. If uh, this is your first time, we've been in this series for a while and uh, for a few weeks now, talking about what it means to reset in our life. There's times that we wish we could reset. We could go back and have a do-over, right? We could have a mulligan if you play golf, you know. I want, that, I want a, a, another swing at it. And... and in reality, in our life, we look and we look at our mistakes and we see where we've been and the things that have happened. And in reality, there is a sense of reset that we can have in Christ. When we surrender our life to Him, it resets, right? We, we've been forgiven for our past and the things that have happened. Um, when we uh, make a mistake and we give that to God and we repent of our sin, it's a reset. Scripture says that, you know, as far as the east is the west, he, he doesn't see that when we surrender that to Him. It's under the blood. It's been covered. And so it's important to realize that. And so this morning, we're looking at the final moments with, with Jesus on the cross, those final six hours of His life. And we've been looking at the different statements that He shared with us. And this morning, uh, we'll, we'll look at another, uh, another statement that he makes, and we will see the significance of it in our own lives and the importance of him making this comment. There's many things, many words that Jesus shared that only God could say. You know, when he said, I am, that God's the only one who can say that. We can't walk around and share those words, right? There's things that we cannot say that only God could say, that only Jesus could say. But then there's some words that Jesus would share that, that we could say. And the one that we're going to look at this, this morning is probably one that we've all said at some point or another in our life. In fact, I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, when we put our kids to bed at night, they have this, this habit of uh, when my wife and I are trying to, you know, get them wound down, we're trying to get them ready for bed. My wife's here on the front row with me. She can testify to this. Um, as we prepare to put them in bed and we take them upstairs, almost every time 
As soon as they get in bed, here's what you hear. But Daddy, I'm thirsty. I, I want something to drink. I haven't had anything since supper or whatever it may be. You know, what they're, what they're doing is what? They're buying time. They're like, I get me another 10 minutes, got to go get me a cup, you know. We know what they're doing. So we've learned to say on their way, hey, before you go upstairs, go what? Get you something to drink and then go on the bed. That way, you know, there's none of this trying to. And then they try to buy time with other things, right? But we've, we've heard this statement over and over, and we perhaps you've made this statement, I am thirsty. And this is a statement that Jesus makes in, in Scripture that we'll look at uh, together. So John chapter 9, verses 28 and 29, let's get started. Scripture says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, what? I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant. They lifted it up to Jesus' lips. It's interesting with this that when Jesus was first crucified in those first six hours, they offered him something to drink. Uh, in fact, in Mark chapter 15, Scripture says that soldiers tried to give Jesus wine mixed with myrrh to drink, but he refused to do so. He, he would not take the drink. So the question is, why did Jesus refuse wine mixed with myrrh, but then later on in the last moments of his life, he turns around and he says, I'm thirsty. And, and so that's what we'll look at this morning. You remember when Jesus was born, right, and, and the wise men visited with, with uh, Jesus, they brought what? Gold, frankincense, and what? And myrrh. And here they're offering him myrrh at the end, and he refuses it. The reason being is that, I don't know if you know this or not, but myrrh is a form of narcotic. It's something to ease the pain, similar to taking, you know, Advil or Tylenol or something like that. They would use one of the primary purposes of myrrh was for pain. And Jesus refused to have the wine mixed with the myrrh. And you say, well, why did he refuse it then? But later on, he wanted it. Uh, the reason he wanted to, he refused it was he wanted to experience the full judgment of your sins and my sins. The full payment that had to be paid. And Jesus was willing to, to go through that. He wanted uh, to be mentally alert as he went through that process. And so the executioners, you know, they, they offered him the, this, this painkiller. They offered him this uh, to, to help sedate him. And the reason why was not because of humanitarian benefits. It wasn't because they felt bad for him. The reason they did this was because they would be there for a day or two days or however long it would take for the criminals or whoever they would place on the cross to die. And they didn't want to hear them screaming the whole time. So they would provide this to sedate them in order that they could play their games or do whatever they were going to do in fellowship and not hear the, the screaming and the agony that would come from the criminals who were, were on the cross. But yet Jesus refuses to drink at that point. But then later, the scripture we just read says Jesus knew everything had been completed. And he says, I'm thirsty, I thirst, I'm thirsty. What, what does that mean after everything had been completed? God's justice had been satisfied. The payment had been made. It had been completed, the payment for our sins. And now he says, I thirst. One of the creeds of, of Christianity that we, that we claim is that Christ died, and it's through Scripture, Christ died, he descended into hell, and three days later, he what? He rose again. And so when he says, I thirst, we need to realize that the word, I thirst, is a cry from hell. Scripture teaches us that there's no water in hell. It is a cry, it's, it's an eternal thirst that they have. There's no water there. So that, that's what we find there where Scripture says in heaven there's a river, you know, a spring, a river flowing through it. And, and so Jesus makes this statement. He says, I thirst. He knew that everything had been completed. The payment has been made. Now he says, I thirst. And so what I want us to look at is that statement, I thirst, this morning. I want us to look at what it means for Jesus, what it means for other people. Like how do we respond to that when we um, go talk to others? And how do, how do we address that? And then how do we look at it in our own life? What does that, uh, what significance does that have in my own life when I read the statement that Jesus said that, that I thirst, that I'm, I'm thirsty? And so we'll look at that together, but I want you to follow me with this for just a moment. Throughout the crucifixion, through, throughout 
the experience that Jesus went through from the time that they arrested him. He had lack of sleep. He was dehydrated. He was losing blood from being beaten. He's went through all of this pain. Not once do we find where Jesus addressed the pain that he was going through. Not once did he turn it and focus it on himself and what he was dealing with. But then he comes to this point where he says it's finished, it's completed, and then he makes the statement and says, I thirst. And he, not one time did he mention pain, and now he says, I'm thirsty. There's a couple of things that I want us to look at through Scripture, and, and one of the reasons in that was what we'll find next week is Jesus is going to make this profound statement, and we'll look at this next week in talking about victory that we have. But he was wanting his, his lips to be moist as he was about to, and he wanted it to be heard, the declaration that he was about, about to make. And we'll look at that next week. But there's a few things I want you to see from this from a, from a spiritual side, from a physical side. He was dehydrated, so physically he was thirsty. We had ju just last week, you know, he looked to his father. He said, Father, why have you, you know, God, why have you forsaken me, right? So spiritually he's thirsty. He's been forsaken from his, um, from his father. He calls out to him as God. And so we, we, we follow through that. So here's what I want us to look at for just a moment at, at how this applies to as we look at Jesus' life and, and the importance of understanding this statement. So number one, if you're taking notes, the statement, I thirst, revealed that Jesus was human. It's important for us to understand that Jesus was, was fully human and fully God. Some people think he was half God and half human. And he, Jesus was not a hybrid, but the Scripture says that He's fully God and that He's fully human. He's 100% God and He's 100% human. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says, Rather, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." It's just as wrong to deny Jesus' humanity as it is to deny that He is God because they're both of significant importance. They're both very vital to understand in our faith. It shows that Jesus really was human when we see that phrase, I thirst. Number two is this. When we read the statement that says, I thirst, it revealed that He was the promised Messiah, that Jesus was the promised Savior all through Scripture. We, we find in the Old Testament over and over and over again, uh, prophecies that would be fulfilled when, when Jesus uh, came to this earth. Prophecies about where he would be born. Prophecies that he would, where he would come out of, that he would go into Egypt so he could come out of Egypt. Prophecies that he would live uh, in Nazareth. Prophecies all throughout the Old Testament about he would perform miracles and raise people from the dead. That's pretty hard to, to fake, right? That prophecies about the things that Jesus would be a part of, that he would be uh, betrayed by one of his friends. There's scripture about prophecies that he would be hung on a cross. The amazing thing about this was the cross was not even in effect yet. It was not invented yet to hang people on the cross. In the Old Testament, thousands of years prior to Jesus um, showing up on the scene as the Messiah, all these prophecies over and over and over again, that there's prophecies that he would be tortured, but yet he would forgive those that were torturing him, right? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He, scripture says they'd be forsaken by God. He'll die a cruel death, that he'll be buried in a rich man's tomb. All these things were many, many, many years early earlier prior to Jesus being born. And, and so we find, we get to this place, there was around 380 or so predictions that were made in the Old Testament towards Jesus in the New Testament and what he would do. Jesus is in his last moments on the cross, and there's one last prophecy to be fulfilled. There's one last prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet. And it's the prophecy that we find in Psalms talking about the Messiah that says that he will be given vinegar to drink. And in Psalm 69, and this is a, a psalm that David was writing here, he says, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. When what the soldiers, if you, if you go back and study, what the soldiers offered Jesus in this moment is a drink called Pascha. Now, Pascha is a, is a drink that's with vinegar, and it's mixed with water or wine, and, and it's something that they would have. It was a drink that uh, the lower class people in Greece and in Rome, uh, I'm sorry, Rome, for about 300 years, it was a drink that they had. Um, 
It was something that they would carry with them. So it was not a surprise that they had this with them at the cross with Jesus there because they knew that when they would go to the cross for a crucifixion, they were going to be there for a while. And they needed something to drink. And so they had that with them. Now the interesting thing with this is that when Scripture shares this, when we find this here, David's given this prophecy about the Messiah will drink vinegar. Uh, this drink had not been uh, created yet. It was not around at that time. But yet the Scripture says that he would be given vinegar on, on the sponge. And so they gave it to him on the cross. Another thing that's very interesting, and I want to take just a moment to, to share that so you can see, was the Scripture says that they took a hyssop stick and they put a sponge on it and then dipped it in order to provide because Jesus couldn't hold it. His hands were on the cross, right? His feet are, are nailed down. There's no way he can hold the cup. And so they provide that for him. Um, to be able to moisten his lips. Now, there's something that's, that's interesting about that. If you go back to the Old Testament, and, and you read through the Old Testament, when God sent Moses to go and set the people free from Pharaoh, um, one of the things that he allowed was these plagues to happen. And there was 10 different plagues. And all these plagues that God sent were making fun of the, the false gods that these Egyptians worshipped. And so they worshipped frogs. So guess what God said? Let's give them more frogs than they can handle, Right? And they, they go on and set several different things uh, happened. You know, the Egyptians, they worshiped cows. So what happened? Their cows got sick. God sent a plague. They worshiped the Nile River. What did God do? He turned it what? Red. They worshiped their firstborn son. And as the final plague, God prepares to do something and God tells the Jews, I'm going to send a spirit into the land that's going to kill all of these firstborn sons as a final plague. And he tells me, he says, but show me your faith. Here's what I want you to do. And, and maybe you know the story. You've read this story before. But I want you to take a lamb, sacrifice a lamb. You're going to take the blood, paint it on the doorpost of your house. And when the death angel comes by, if the blood is there, it will pass by. You'll be covered from being a part of this wrath that's going to happen. And there's where we get the word Passover. Jews still celebrate it today. In fact, this weekend, they're celebrating that. Um, so a very significant time. And so the death angel would pass by. Do you know what the Scripture tells Mo God tells Moses in the Old Testament? Listen to this. He tells him, he says, Take a branch of a hyssop plant, dip it in the bowl with the blood, wipe the blood on the sides and the tops of the door frames. So when you fast forward, and as they look up, and they have a hyssop branch with a sponge, and they're pointing it up towards the, the Savior, the Messiah, and as he's dying on the cross, his blood's being shed. As we reflect back on the Old Testament, the hyssop branch was, the blood was on it, it was wiped on the doors, that the doors with, with the blood there, it covered them from the death angel. And as the hyssop branch was being raised up to the Messiah, it was a symbolism there and again that the blood that he was shedding would cover our sins if we surrender our life to him. He provided a way of salvation. He, he made a way for you and for me. And so a couple of things there. When Jesus says, I'm thirsty, one, it shows us that he's human, that he, he felt the pain that he went through. It also shows us that he was the promised Messiah. But it also shows us this third, the, the next one. It shows us how much he really loves us. And I won't spend a whole lot of time here because we looked at this last week, but he's, he's dying for the redemption of others. He's, he's dying for your sins and for my sins, to provide a way for, for salvation. He's going to be thirsty for our benefit, that we would not have to thirst in that way, that we would not have to be separated from God in that way. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ did what? Say it. Christ died for us. And that's exactly what happened on the cross. He provided a way of salvation. He was on the cross to provide a way. Listen, he went through hell so you and I don't have to go there. He faced that, that you and I do not have to face that eternal flame. He went through those things because He loved us in spite 
you know, of, of our sinful nature. He did that because He loved us. Love is an action, and when love meets action, then we do something for others. We love other people. We help meet their needs or whatever it may be, with physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. You know, we, we look, and in our community and in our culture, there's billions of people who are thirsty. In our community, there's hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of people who are thirsty. And they don't know what they're thirsty for. And they're longing to fill it, and they, and they don't know how to describe it. And so you will not hear people walking around saying, I'm thirsty. But here's what you will find. And so let me give you some synonyms this morning to, to provide other words for that. When you hear people say, my life seems unfulfilled. There's no meaning. I can't see tomorrow. I'm struggling. I'm unsatisfied. I'm not happy. I'm bored. On and on and on. Those words could be transferred to, I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. And they're longing for it. And, and they can't find it in the things that they're looking at. And in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, I'm reminded of this text. It was the first sermon, one of the first sermons I ever preached as a kid when I first started preaching. I was very young, still learning a lot, still am now. But in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, Scripture says, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, while I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst of water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young women and strong young men will faint because of what? Because of thirst. Isn't this a perfect description of our culture? People who look good on the outside but are completely empty on the inside. People who look like they have it together but yet they're all messed up. And on the inside they're depressed, discouraged. Now we see this with celebrities, right? We think, man, they have it all together. They have all the resources that you could ever imagine. They have all of these things. But yet on the inside they're in despair and they're empty and they're unfulfilled and they're unsatisfied and they're going from one thing to the next trying to find hope. Why? Because they're thirsty. They're longing for something more. And so our response is this. How do I respond to this to help others? What, do, what am I to do with it? Look at, with, look at this with me on the screen. The way I serve Jesus is by serving others. Look to the person beside you and tell them you've got to serve other people. Go ahead, tell them. Or a better word for it is it's not just about you, that, right? That would be a better word. It's not just about you. You've got to serve other people. The only way you can serve God is by serving other people. Now, one day when we reach heaven, we will be able to see him and, and physically be there and, and serve him. But here on earth, the way that we serve God is by serving people. people. Scripture teaches that. Matthew chapter 25 37 through 40, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for who? You did for me. In other words, you serve God by serving who? Other people. We serve God by serving others. Notice Jesus didn't perform a miracle on the cross there to provide himself with water. What is the first miracle that happened when Jesus started his ministry? He turned at a, at a wedding, he turned water into what? He turned water into wine. Now here it is, his last moments. Surely could, it, could he have performed a miracle and provided water in his mouth? Could he have provided a way to give himself water? Absolutely. Because he's God. But yet he didn't. Why? He asked for human assistance. He asked for the help of others. The importance of serving. At this point, his hands and feet, right, they're nailed down. And he's asking for something. And the soldiers who were not even believers, they run and they get the, the stick and the sponge and they provide for him, even, not even knowing him as Savior. But yet they what? They served in that moment. Um, what, a, what a, a tremendous scene to see that happen. And the point is this, 
that God's going to do many things through us and He will use us to, to do great things for Him and, and to, to serve Him as we serve people. But sometimes I think we get caught up and we begin to pray and we say, God, and we see somebody hurting or we see something going on and we get, a, you know, we get stirred inside and we say, God, why don't you do something about that? And then perhaps God speaks back to you and says, I was going to ask you the same question. We serve God by serving other people. Suffering is always an opportunity to provide service. When we, we see suffering, it's always an opportunity um, to provide love, to, to provide um, and, and to serve. And we, everyone around us is in need at some point or another, and God says, here's your opportunity. Number two in that is how do we respond is this. The smallest acts still serve Jesus. And this is, this is vital to our faith and understanding how we live because I think a lot of times, I, I, and I hear this, you know, man, I want to do something great for God. Man, I want to do something great. I want to do something big for God. And I think God responds back and says, no, no, you don't need to do anything great for me. You need to do something small for me. And here's why, because there's small things around us every single day that need to get done. But we bypass all the small things because we want the great thing. And the scripture says until we're found faithful with the small things, God's not going to provide the great thing. And in fact, I mean, he's already great. He, he's the one that works in and through, and he is a great God. But he looks for us to be faithful in those small things. And so we need to realize the smallest acts of service are, are still important. You, I want you to write this down. I shared this with first service. It's not the size of your service that matters. It's not. It's the amount of love you put into it. It's not the size of your service. It's not, I want to do something big for God. It's not about the size. I know a lot of people who are wanting to do something or are attempting to do something big for God, but there may not be much love in it. It's not the size of your service or what, you want, or what you're wanting to do. It's the amount of love in which you, you serve and, and the love that you have in it. Matthew chapter 10, verses 42. And if anyone gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones who is, who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. So in other words, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be just a worship leader. You don't have to think, uh, go through these things. And I want to do this or I want to do that. All of the things that happen here from Journeytown to serving in nursery to providing coffee. This morning, there were people here at 645 this morning preparing for what would happen today. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. There is nothing that's big or little. It's all important in God's eyes. There's no service that's too small. Because it's not about the size of your service, but it's about the heart in which you serve. It's important to, to, to realize that. And, and number three, along with that, is this. Is, and this one's hard. And uh, it, it was pretty quiet this morning when I got to the third one. They were like, preacher, get past this one. But when we see Jesus on the cross, it reminds us of this. I serve Jesus by serving my enemy. Now, that's a hard one to swallow. You know, Jesus looks and says, Father, forgive them. They, they don't understand. And if we're going to live like him and we're going to serve like him, then we have to be willing to serve our enemies. And just last week, we talked about righteous anger. And, and if I confess with you, there's times that I really challenge myself and have to question myself, is this a righteous anger? Or is this a self-centeredness anger? Is this an anger just because of my pride or, or they're you know, trying to come at me or whatever it may be? Or is it a righteous anger because they're coming at you, God? W w where's the anger coming from? A and it's important to realize that when our enemy comes against us, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 says this, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he's what? Thirsty. Give him some water to drink. In other words, we serve, we serve our, our enemies. The most Christ-like service is when we serve our, our enemies. You may say, come on, I don't like their lifestyle. I don't like their p political views. I don't like the fact that they don't like me. And on and on and on. But what it means to be a follower of Christ is even when they're our enemies that we should love God's the one that judges. God's the one that will bring judgment. But we love 
We reach out to them, and we serve them. And so what about ourselves in closing? Just three quick things. How do, I, how do I handle this in my own life? Some things that we need to have a gut check in ourselves. Number one is this. Through this text, we realize I need to recognize what I thirst for. This is where reset comes in, by the way. We need to have a reset and reevaluate what it is that I thirst for because it's very easy to get off track from thirsting for what, what God provides. That is an eternal thing that he quenches in us. But if we get caught up in the world, we get caught up in our own things, before you know it, it's easy to start pursuing something different, going after something different, and you get caught up in it, and you have to hit the reset button and say, God, I'm going down the wrong path. I need to hit the reset. Come back. What is it that I really thirst for? In other words, another way to put it is this. You can write this sentence down or just look at it. If I could just get blank, I would be happy. If I could just get married, I would be happy. If I could just get a job, I would be happy. If I could just have kids, I'd be happy. If I could just get my health back, I'd be happy. If I could just get my dad back or my mom, someone who's passed, if I could get them back, I'd be happy. If you fill that in with anything else other than Christ, you're thirsting after the wrong thing. And those things will only satisfy you for a temporary time. Christ is the only one who fills that void. There's a God-shaped hole in every human life that God created us. He wired us that way, and he's the only one who can fill that. He's the only one who can work in that and meet those needs. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. Um, there's a, a country song by a man named Johnny Lee, and some of you who like country music, uh, you've probably heard this song before. Looking for love in what? All the wrong places. How many of us can testify to that this morning? I've been, there's been times where I've looked for love in the wrong places, right? I've looked for life in the wrong places. I've looked for fulfillment in the wrong places. Looking in the wrong places. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. God is the one who fills that. Number two, I need to recognize that Jesus understands my pain. We, we've already addressed this through the message, but listen, Jesus went through that pain on the cross. He, he understands your physical pain. He understands um, the things that you're going through emotionally, spiritually. He, he went through those things as, as human. He, he, he faced those trials, and, and you may be here this morning, and, and different things going on in your life just to realize that Jesus understands the pain that, that you're going through. And, and that's the hope, and as we look through him on the cross and we see uh, we, we look at the words he shared with us. It gives us hope in realizing that Jesus is there with us. And the last one is this. I need to recognize that I have to stop looking for fulfillment elsewhere. There has to come a point where we reset and we stop looking in all the wrong places. We stop looking everywhere else to try to make our lives feel significant, to try to make our lives feel like we're worth something or, or that we're doing something. We need to realize our worth is not found in those things, but it's found in Christ. And if I just get this, I would be happy. Uh, Jeremiah, Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 13. I want you to look at this. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. God says, not only have you rejected me, but you've abandoned a well that's full of water that never ends. You've created your own well that is broken and it cannot sustain. So in other words, it continue, you continue to have to dig new wells because the well won't sustain. It cannot hold water. So where are you digging your wells? Maybe you've abandoned that and you've, you've, you're digging a well in your job. Well, sooner or later, that fulfillment's going to be gone. So you dig a well over here in, in this relationship that you don't need to be in, and you're digging a well because there's some satisfaction that you're getting from it, but sooner or later that'll be gone. 
You, you find other things. You start digging all these wells only to find that they become empty. And if you would just turn around and realize that the Niagara Falls is right behind you, flowing, spring full of water, and if you would just realize that, you can get back into a water that never ends. And that's the, the water that Jesus provides for us. John chapter 7, verses 37, 38. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said with a loud voice, Let anyone who is what? Thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, and the scripture said, uh, has said, rivers of living water will flow from and within them. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. The last verse here says, uh, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Talking about the water that we drink, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up uh, to eternal life. And so the words that we find when Jesus shared, I thirst, we see the significance through it in our lives as we, we look through and see those things. So let me explain this in closing, and, and we'll, I'll pray for you guys, and um, we'll end our service this morning and worship together. And we know this. This is not something new to you. Sin is addicting. But it will always leave you thirsty. Sin is addicting, but it will always leave you thirsty. Ask someone who struggles with pornography. Why do they go back and go back and go back? One, sin is addicting. Two, it always leaves them thirsty. Find someone who struggles with prescription pills or, or something else. It's addicting, and what? It always leaves them what? Thirsty. Wanting more, wanting more, wanting more, and more. And Jesus says, when you look to me, you'll be permanently satisfied, and you will thirst no more. That he'll provide that for us. And so here's the question. If you feel unsatisfied with your life, that's called spiritual thirst. And the only one who can quench that thirst is the very one who said, I thirst. And he went through that so that you and I would not have to. He provided a way. He paid for what you and I don't have to pay for. He became thirsty so we would never have to thirst again. And he made that a way for you and for me. And so my question this morning in closing is, are you ready to drink from water that will permanently satisfy you? It's time to reset. Look to the person beside you and tell them, it's time to reset. It's time to reset my values. It's time to reset my life. It's time for me to reset everything and to realize the things that I'm thirsting af after and stop looking elsewhere. It's time to reset. With every head bowed and eye closed, I want to pray for you in closing. Father, I pray for every individual that's represented in here this morning or those that may be watching online as well. Um, God, we call it a lot of things. Unfulfilled life, not satisfied, desperate, not happy struggling but the spiritual word there God is that we're thirsty I'm tired of looking in all the wrong places realizing that only you can fulfill that thirst that we have and God I pray that, that we would be in a place that we would reset God that we would reevaluate our life and that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness and your scripture Matthew that we read this morning says that we shall be filled God there's families in here that need to be filled God there's individuals in here that need to be filled God there's people in here that are far from you that have never accepted you as Savior and Lord they need to be filled with the Spirit God they need to surrender their life to you so Lord I pray right now for salvation to happen in people's lives Lord as they um, repent of their sins and confess you as Lord. I pray for others that are believers, God, but they've just got on the wrong path for a while. It's time to reset. Lord, with everything we have, we give it to you, God. With everything we have, we surrender it to you. With no one looking around, if that's you and you would say, Pastor Benji, I need to give my life to Jesus this morning. I need to surrender my life to him. No one looking around. If that's the decision that you need to make this morning, I want to be able to pray for you as we prepare to worship together. If that's you and no one looking around, if you would just raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, 
three. Hands are already going up. Thank you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you for raising your hands. Thank you. I see your hand. Any others? I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss. Would there be others in here that would be willing to confess and say, I'm a believer. I am a follower of Jesus. But some of my values have been placed in the wrong area, and I need to reset and focus back on being filled with Christ and not this world. If that would be you this morning, let's raise our hands together. Thank you for raising our hands. Father, these hands that are all over the room this, in this building this morning, God, for even those that may be watching online, God, we celebrate the, the salvation that's happened in individuals' lives. God, we thank you for that. We know, again, as we say every week, the angels in heaven are rejoicing over that. And God, we rejoice with them as they take those next steps. Father, I pray for others in here that are believers, but God, have just gotten distracted, which is what Satan would want us to do. Uh, Lord, that we would reset and start back and be focused on, in on your word and your ways as we follow you. Lord, we give you everything we have this morning as we continue to worship in this place. In Jesus' name, we pray and we give him the glory. God bless. Let's stand to our feet. Can we let those know the round that gave their life to Christ this morning how excited we are for them? Amen.
Foster, the executive pastor here at Journey. Uh, my family and I came here five years ago, and um, we thank God for the opportunity to serve God among you here. We appreciate about two weeks ago was our fifth year anniversary, and we're honored to be able to serve God here and honored to serve you. So thank you. Uh, um, I want to mention a couple of announcements and then look at some financial stuff briefly. But I wanted to mention, first of all, for all of you guys here, tomorrow evening at 6.30, right here, um, we'll have a meal provided and uh, have hamburgers and want to encourage you to bring chips or drinks or desserts. And we'll have a men's ministry meeting. All guys, doesn't matter young or old, want all of you to come and invite some of your family or friends to come with you too. It'll be an open invitation. We'd love to have you. We'll have one of our guys giving about a five-minute testimony. And then Travis Dowers, who are our men's ministry director, will be teaching us for 20 minutes or 25 minutes he's shared with me. Travis is a great guy. You need to hear what God has laid on his heart. I want to encourage you to come and be here tomorrow evening at 6.30 for a brief time of fellowship and food together. And then also, we, uh, next Sunday... After the morning service, after the 11 o'clock worship service, we will have a uh, membership luncheon. There will be uh, food that will be provided for any of you guys that are interested in being a part of Journey and joining up with the fellowship. Um, we'll have a brief time of lunch together, have probably Subway sandwiches and chips and drinks, and we'll come into the worship center. Then Pastor Benji will share with us 20 or 30 minutes about membership, about journey, about who we are, the vision of the church, and about what God is using us to do. And um, if, you, if you'd like to be a part of that, you feel free to come. And if you'll just, if you'll fill out a connect card and write your name on it, maybe if you've got a family of five, if you'll just write, uh, for example, foster and put a five on it and circle that, I don't know when I look at the connect card that you want to be a part of the membership luncheon next Sunday. All right, let's move on to the area of finances. 
And in the area of finances, I want to give you an overview of what God led us through in 2015.